Hey guys, welcome back to the Skills Lab here at EKU. Today we're going to talk about end tidal CO2 monitoring, end tidal capnometry and capnography and how to use them. And we're going to teach you about how to use the equipment, how to interpret the waveforms, and how to correlate what you get from that equipment with your patient. The important things to know is that this is something that's in the scope of practice for EMTs and paramedics alike. It's actually written into state statutes that EMTs are allowed to do this. So this isn't anything that is unique to Powell County EMS or that we need special protocols for. You can do this as an EMT or as a paramedic because the law lets you do it. So I think that's pretty cool. That's something that's kind of unique to Kentucky. And take advantage of that. Use that power you have to really get uh, a lot of insight into your patient's condition by using uh, the end tidal waveform that's going to pop up right here on our Life Pack 15s. So let's get into it and let's learn how to use this. So you've probably noticed by now that on the ambulance we carry actually three different kinds of end tidal CO2 monitoring devices. The first kind that you've probably seen in the airway roll specifically is this guy. This little color metric device, it fits on the end of your tube, uh, be it a King LT or be it an end tidal tube and um, you can get um, feedback from this little window right here. So when CO2 hits it, it turns gold, and when there's oxygen hitting it, it's purple, and it alternates between purple and gold as you ventilate the patient. We'll come back to this guy in a second, but uh, just keep this in the back of your mind. The other kind of monitoring device we have is this inline CO2 device. And then we have a side stream end tidal CO2 device, the so-called nasal cannula or um, you know, combination nasal cannula end tidal device. And it has this uh, traditional nasal cannula prongs and then a little sensor down here to pick up the end tidal CO2. So whether you're doing side stream end tidal monitoring on a, uh, on a patient or in line, these things get hooked up the same way. You need to find the little uh, orange tip so both the side stream and the inline have the same orange tip. And as you're turning your monitor on, or if it's on already, um, we're just going to plug these things into this little port that is right here above the, um, above the SPO2 connection. This little black eye right here. It has a little uh, magnetic cover on it to keep it safe. So I'm, I'm going to actually start with the, uh, the inline one. And, and look what happens. I'm going to go ahead and uh, take this paper off and string it out. And, and look what happens when I plug it into the port. Watch the screen on the monitor. Screw it in, and automatically a little new window pops up here. And if this was on our patient who we were ventilating uh, through a tube, when they start to breathe, you'll start to see the numbers in the waveform. Okay, so we see the numbers here, but we actually have to select the waveform. So I'm going to take my knob, I'm going to scroll down here to this uh, bottom row, and click it, Just hit waveform again, and select um, uh, CO2. And I want it on auto scale, and then I'm just going to hit the home button. So now when the patient is, uh, is being ventilated, not only do we have a number here, we'll have a waveform. Okay, so we have numbers and waveforms. And this side stream device here, this goes on uh, to the monitor the exact same way. So um, as a quick reminder of the difference between these two is this would be for a conscious patient who is breathing spontaneously. They might not be breathing well. You might actually end up assisting their ventilations with a bag valve mask if their tidal volume is too low. But this is fundamentally for patients who are breathing spontaneously and, and don't have a tube in their throat and this guy is if they do have a tube in their throat. You can also put this between, oh, that's actually a really good time to point out that if the monitor believes that the patient has stopped breathing, then it's gonna give you an alarm. So that could be just because you've removed the um, side stream probe or, or the inline probe from the patient while it's still hooked up, but it would also be a reminder that your spontaneously breathing patient has suddenly become apneic. Um, so I went ahead and silenced the alarm, but um, this is for a patient who is breathing spontaneously. This is for a patient who you're ventilating for. This guy can go between the mask and the bag of a bag valve mask. So even if you're just providing 
um, basically BLS ventilations with just a, a mask to, to face kind of a situation, you can still be monitoring end tidal with this. Um, and, uh, and that's how these things get connected. Um, so I'm going to turn off my monitor here for just a second to come back to the color metric device. All right, so we have two options. We've got the, the good old color metric. It's still in the kits. We have this inline, um, and typically I like to keep this in the rear pouch of the, uh, of the cardiac monitor, but you might find them in the airway roll too. Um, so why is this superior to this? It's because of that waveform that you saw when I started breathing through it. That waveform, that cyclical waveform, lets you know that you have rhythmic respirations. This guy can be fooled by the presence of CO2 coming from anywhere um, that winds up in the mouth. So if your patient drank uh, a two liter of soda before they went into cardiac arrest, you might actually tube the goose, so to speak. You might have your endotracheal tube in the esophagus, and the CO2 coming out of their esophagus will make it look like you're breathing for the patient and your tube has been placed properly. That's not gonna happen on a waveform. You would just get what looks like static if uh, uh, CO2 is coming out of their stomach. So it's really this guy. It's the waveform that helps you confirm two placement. When you squeeze the bag um, and you re release it again, you'll get a waveform for, from a patient who um, has any sort of um, basically biological respiration going on. This guy's not gonna give it to you. So he can fool you. And the only reason that we still carry these is that they're required. They're on the K-beams checklist. They have to be present. Um, but this is really the gold standard of airway management and tube confirmation. So I don't really use these anymore. Um, EMTs and paramedics alike can use this guy and that waveform, uh, that's, that's the money right there. Hey guys, I wanna talk about some pitfalls and some complications you may run into when using this side stream in tidal CO2 nasal, nasal cannula. For one, this is not a good oxygen delivery device. That means that if you have a patient that needs a lot of oxygen, let's say four or five liters per minute with a nasal cannula, this thing is not gonna be that good to use. And here's why. If you look at the size of these prongs, and if you were to compare them to the size of just say a regular nasal cannula, you can see they're quite a bit smaller, okay? Also, if I flip this over, and I hope you can see the fenestrations there, you'll see all these fenestrations. That means that some of the oxygen that you're delivering to this patient is actually going out these holes. Now, another reason that it's a poor oxygen delivery device is that if you look on this side, you'll see this tubing is bigger than this tubing. That's because oxygen is only being delivered through one side. This side is used for sampling, all right? Now, if you increase the oxygen, let's say above two or three liters per minute, what you're actually going to do is decrease the accuracy of your entitled CO2 measurement. You will wash out uh, some CO2 that the patient is exhaling, and it will give you a falsely low measurement. All right? So I'm going to put this on, and I'm going to demonstrate how it works. Okay, you will see on this particular uh, entitled side stream nasal cannula that the oxygen tubing is already connected. So it comes with this particular uh, product. Some of the uh, products that we have or some of the uh, side stream nasal cannulas don't actually come with this. So we have to get a separate supply tubing uh, and connect it to it. All right, so let's just break down really quickly the normal end tidal CO2 waveform and then talk about a couple of key variations on that waveform. Uh, we're gonna follow this video up with some, a uh, lot more explanations on different kinds of waveforms, but this is just kind of a quick primer into all this stuff. So looking at the screen here, we see our ECG waveform on the top, our uh, SpO2 waveform um, or PLEF that is uh, kind of in the middle there in, in blue, um, and then the end tidal CO2 waveform at the bottom, um, our actual cap, capna, uh, capnography gives us a little graph as opposed to capnometry, which is just the number. And, and if you look at these things, if you kind of go down the row here from the ECG to the pleth to the end tidal, 
um, the the high points on it match up pretty nicely. You know, it's not quite one to one because we have uh, lots of different rates going on with these different things, but um, they they actually do match up pretty closely. The the body's humming along, and the heart is beating and squirting blood out to the fingertips, and the respiratory cycle is is basically being powered by that perfusion itself, and so and so things match up you know, pretty nicely graphically. And that's a really important thing to recognize. When we start to see um, things get out of, out of phase or out of sequence on these different waveforms, uh, there may be a problem to investigate. So if we look at this waveform much more closely, this is what a nice, normal, end tidal CO2 waveform looks like. You can see over there uh, to the right uh, where the numbers are flashing that the, the respiratory rate is approximately 27. And so it's a little bit high, but uh, certainly lots of patients are breathing at that rate um, relatively normally, maybe because they're nervous or excited or something like that. Um, so this waveform looks pretty good. And, and you can see this really nice rhythmic um, uh, plateau shape. And so what you're really looking at here on each one of these little plateaus is um, where the waveform increases, that's actually end tidal CO2, the, the carbon dioxide that's coming out of the patient's mouth and nose as they exhale, um, that's, that is that quantity of gas being picked up by the filter. So in other words, the, the low points, the little valleys here, uh, that's when they're inhaling. So they take a breath in and there's, there's no CO2. So the sensor's picking up nothing because it's not reading oxygen, it's reading the CO2. So the low points are when they're breathing in and when they breathe out, think of a, literally visualize the CO2 coming out of their airway and the amount rises and rises and rises and rises until it comes out of their mouth and nose and the sensor picks it up and then they exhale for some period of time, that's the plateau, and then they start to inhale again and the level drops. That's not a literal description of this waveform, but that's how I think of it. I think of this rising level of CO2 as they exhale um, and as the sensor picks up more and more gas and then they take a breath in and it plummets. And so that's the inspiratory, expiratory phase. Inhalation is the valleys and exhalation is the peaks. And you want them to look like this plateau that's slightly uh, angled upwards on top just a, a little bit, you know, that's maybe like a, like a 10 degree rise on that little plateau. All right, so this is normal. This is a nice normal waveform. And even if the respiratory rate was much faster or much slower, that might be a problem, but we know that if this waveform looks normal, then their lungs are essentially functioning normally. All right, so let's take this guy's respiratory rate way down, just to take a look at some examples here. Let's take it down to something like uh, six. So you'll see that these waveforms start to spread out big time. So, this might be something like a, uh, an overdose patient um, who, you know, is just not breathing sufficiently. And in a lot of cases, you would expect the end tidal number itself to, uh, to be askew uh, because they might be uh, retaining much more CO2 uh, or maybe whatever's causing the slow respiratory rate is actually interfering with their, uh, their ability to actually exchange gases. And so maybe it's a lot lower. So forget about the number just for a second, and let's concentrate on the waveform. What you see here is a much broader waveform because the respiratory rate is slowed down so much. So it's just, a, it's just a, a longer period of exhalation with huge pauses in between the inhalations. These valleys are enormous because the respiratory rate is so slow. Each one of these little valleys is basically a breath in, and they're spaced out super slow they're only breathing six times a minute. And what tends to happen is that the exhalation is similarly prolonged, but it might not be. It might be really short, um, and you might see a different kind of waveform where you still have these big, big valleys, but the exhalation complexes are abbreviated. Uh, all right, so just some, some basic concepts here for how to interpret waveforms. So this is uh, one of the principal uh, variations on the normal waveform that you really want to be familiar with. And this is a, a waveform that's associated with bronchospasm. And a lot of times when we think about spasming, you know, you think about a, a muscle that's, um, you know, quivering back and forth, but 
Um, that's not always the case. It doesn't always have like you know, uh, a spasming is not always like a like a fibrillation kind of activity. Um, it can just be uh, tensing, or it can be more rhythmic clenching and unclenching. Um, and so, in the case of bronchospasm, we're talking about spasms in the lung tissue, um, in the t well, not in the lung tissue, but in the bronchioles um, and the bronchial tree, um, the smooth muscle that forms the pipes that actually feed your lungs. Uh, and so this is a rhythm that would be associated with something like asthma, which is a bronchospastic disease. So what, what you should be able to see on the waveform here in comparison to the normal waveform where you have these, those nice big blocks with the plateau on top is that this waveform is sort of clipped. It looks like shark fins. So if we examine each one of these uh, little complexes, you see that we have this normal rise of CO2 as the patient exhales, and then right at the tippy top there, it, it gets clipped and it falls really dramatically. We've lost that sort of broad, flat plateau that we saw in the first rhythm. And, and you know, you may have picked up by now that I tend to think in very uh, visual ways. It really helps me understand what's going on. I, I, when I'm dealing with a patient, I try to actually visualize what's going on inside their body. And it's not always a direct one-to-one -one relationship between that visual image and what you're seeing in terms of these numbers, but I think it can help explain what's going on in a lot of cases. So when I see this waveform, I think of that spasming, like a muscle spasm, like you have a spasm in your, in your back or your calf or something like that, and your muscle tenses up. And I think of the bronchial tree and the smooth muscles of the bronchioles tensing up and spasming real quick and sort of clipping off uh, the, exhal the exhalation of the patient. And, and again, that's not like a perfect literal description of what's happening. It just helps me make the connection in my mind between what I'm seeing what's going on in the patient. And what's actually going on inside the patient's airway is you have uneven emptying of all the different little spaces and pockets and bron uh, branches of, of the bronchioles and, and in the lungs. And because of that uneven emptying, you have this, uh, you know, this nice uh, initial sort of like charge of CO2 that's coming up out of the airway, and then you have some irritation and some spasming and some mucus plugging and other things going on, and it's, it's just interfering with the ability of all that CO2 to, to really get on out of that respiratory tree in a, in a nice, uh, complete and, and sort of rhythmic way. Um, so this is still a regular pattern, right? We still have a uh, kind of uh, predictability between the complexes, um, but it's abbreviated. Uh, so we can see that difference really clearly on that shark fin appearance. All right, so this is a bronchospastic kind of waveform. And why is this so important? Is because patients have, can have lots of different conditions that produce um, difficulty breathing and even wheezing. So if you have a patient who has a history of CHF, but also has a history of asthma, for example, and you're not sure what you're dealing with, you put them on your side stream nasal cannula and tidal CO2 probe, and you see this rhythm. And you can say to yourself, ah, it's probably not congestive heart failure. It's probably something that's causing their bronchioles to spasm. This seems to be an exacerbation of their asthma rather than their CHF. So we're, we're not going to do things like give them uh, nitro and morphine and things of that nature. We're going to give them albuterol to try to open up those airways, um, maybe even some epinephrine at the paramedic level. Um, and so you can see that interpreting your waveform is key to really figuring out what's going on inside your patient's body. Okay, let's imagine you respond to a patient who's unresponsive and not breathing. You get there and you immediately start chest compressions after verifying that there was not a pulse. And you start ventilating. Uh, let's just, for the sake of discussion, say you put it in a king airway and you instruct your partner to ventilate at a rate of 10 a minute. All right, so once you start ventilating, you would expect to see a waveform, uh, an entitled CO2 waveform, come up on the screen. If you look, you can see one barely just creeping up there, right above the baseline. That's not that good. And if we actually look at what our actual end tidal CO2 is, it is 10. 10 is pretty low. The, the value of your end tidal CO2 depends on perfusion to the lungs. So we know that if we have a low end tidal CO2 value, then we probably don't have great perfusion to our lungs. So the first thing I'm going to do is look at whoever's doing chest compressions, and if they look like they're getting fatigued, I'm going to rotate compressors, okay? Or it may be that they're leaning on the chest, or they're not 
allowing full recoil. So I'm going to have them uh, compress at the proper depth, the proper rate with full recoil, and we'll see what happens to the entitled CO2 then. Now if you look right below uh, the entitled CO2 uh, number, you'll see the respiratory rate. The respiratory rate is 9. That's actually pretty good. So one of the things that's very deleterious to a patient in cardiac arrest is hyperventilation because when you hyperventilate, you increase intrathoracic pressure and decrease venous return. So I want that right between 8 and 10. Um, so if I saw that and it was 12, I would tell them that they're ventilating just a little too fast and it'll slow down just a little bit or give one breath every 10th compression. Now you can see that the end CO2 came up to 21, which is pretty good. We want it to be at least 20, and if it's above 20, or the higher it is, then that predicts a greater chance of ROSC. Now let's imagine the patient was in V-fib, we've been doing good quality compressions, and we've shocked him. Alright, so there we've got V-fib, we've defibrillated him, and it has restored to a sinus rhythm. But let's just imagine that we're still doing chest compressions and we don't know that it restored. So our CO2 was initially about 21. So if after we defibrillate, the entitled CO2 jumps up to 41, then that's a huge jump, right? So we're probably not going to get that huge of a leap from 21 to 41 just by changing chest compressors. The more likely explanation for this huge increase in entitled CO2 is that we had a return of spontaneous circulation. Now, I'm not going to immediately stop CPR to check for a pulse, but I am going to prepare for ROSC on my next rhythm analysis, and I'm going to hope for it. Hey, thanks for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this brief review of some core entitled CO2 principles. Um, we hope to deliver much more, and we're going to go in greater in depth, uh, so tune in again. See ya.